Thank you so much, Astrid, Henrique, Christian, for inviting me to talk today and to present the work for my book, and also for engaging in this very stimulating converse, conversation over spas this year. I'm a great admirer of this project, which investigates so many of the leads that I find essential in spa studies. So I wanted to start by congratulating you. Uh, so. The, the, my talk today is called Beyond Bars, 18th Century British Spas in Medicine and Literature. And it is based on a, a book that I have been working on for the past two years and which should be out early, early 2022 at Manchester University Press. And this book is called Murky Waters, British Mineral Waters in 18th Century Medicine and Literature. And the main idea for this book is first, you know, to explore the ambiguity of the medical and literary discourse on mineral waters, far from the glorious accounts uh, usually associated with them, hence the term murky, uh, evoking mud and the materiality of the water cure, as well as danger, which is a common trope around spa towns. The second thread uh, of this book is to give an account of the variety of spas in 18th century Britain. Spa towns, of course, but also springs and wells in the 18th century, their treatments and their users. And that's why I called the, the, the talk today Beyond Bath, because when we evoke 18th century mineral waters in Britain, you know, Bath comes up. And very often it is the focus of, of a lot of articles, uh, except of course the, the classical book by Phyllis Hembury, which is giving a, a wider sociological, you know, historical view of spas. But I wanted to focus more on medicine and literature in my book. So to give you an overview of my approach, um, I will first start with 18th century British spas and explain the kind of categories I've tried to, to determine around them and give examples of these categories. And then I will, you know, talk about spas as places of cure and care, focusing on the medical and finish on what are in fact my three last chapters uh, on spa politics, gender, religion and economics. So to start on the question of mapping mineral waters in the 18th century, I want to uh, start with the story of this map. This map was actually given as a gift to me. Uh, and you, you, you have to know that I was writing the book for my habilitation, uh, which is, I think you have this in Germany as well, right? Where you have to, to write a new monograph and present it together with the bulk of your work uh, for habilitation. And uh, I, I was focusing, talking about spas obsessively for one year. And I had already started working on a map of mineral waters, which you will see afterwards. But as a gift for my habilita <laughs> habilitation, a friend gave me this 18th century map, which I thought was wonderful, but also tremendously depressing because there are so many spas I had not mentioned and not talked about on this map. Uh, what's interesting in this map is that um, in the end, I, I am still very grateful of our present, of course. Uh, and it's a map of the late 18th century. So taking a picture of the state of, of uh, bathing places and mineral waters then in 1797 by John Andrews in his Atlas of Britain. And it's a, it really gives us a, a frame, I think, to understand how mineral waters would have been figured out by a cartographer. Interestingly, he blends uh, petrifying wells that could be visited as an amusement with Calibiate springs, cold wells and sea bathing places. So there is a continuum there. Uh, and it's actually similar to the, the, the approach I've tried to, had, to have in the book where um, I, I set up a big uh, database of the spa patterns and wells that I was finding out about and tried to establish categories for them. So if you, you, Bath is in red because Bath is 
you know, top notch, uh, has this international reputation, European reputation. So it's on another level, I would say. And uh, but in the first categories, I think that uh, several spa towns can be considered, you know, usually as um, what we associate with spa towns. That is to say that um, they have a reputation that uh, grew through the protection and financial support of royal noble patronage. They were developed enough to provide lodging for their visitors. They had premises for a variety of entertainment. Their social life of their visitors was monitored and centralized by a common schedule and often overseen by a master of ceremonies. I have inserted on the uh, top right corner, a picture of Dickie Dickinson, who was a fa famous master of ceremonies in Scarborough. Uh, and their waters could come in various ways, drinking or bathing, and sometimes within one spa town, you could find various springs, as in Harrogate, for example, which had uh, several wells. And you know this because Harrogate, I know, is part of the focus of, of the European spa. Uh, a good example of this is uh, Chetnam. Chetnam really rises in the second half of the 18th century, and it got famous, especially with the royal visit of George III, uh, and um, in this caricature by uh, Cruikshank, it's a caricature of, his, of uh, George III's visit, where he is uh, drinking all the water from the spa with the queen trying to stop him. And uh, you can also see the, the poor peasants uh, on the on the right hand side of the of the image, who are saying, "Lord." Uh, and they're, they're re the, the people on the left are pumping the water. And one of the, one of the messages is that, in fact, there were problems of flow in Chetnam. Uh, very often people would come early in the morning, get all the water they could get. And then there were, you know, issues because people coming later to take the waters and drink the waters uh, would not... Um, would not get enough water. Now, Chetnam is an interesting, has an interesting story of uh, discovery uh, because it is said to have been found because pigeons were pecking at the salts after one of the, uh, of the meadows through which m mineral waters were flowing had been overflowed. And once it dried up, some salt was remaining. It's a saline water indeed. And I find this story and all those stories about spa discoveries very interesting. I'm currently writing an article on them because it tells us something about, you know, relationship to the environment, to the origins, uh, animals and science. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of spas have their own local legend, if I may, and, and there are interesting narratives. There, it's not part of my book, it's another article. Um, so, Chetnam is, oh, and one more thing on Chetnam is that it is usually in the second half of the 18th century associated with an idea of respectability. Uh, and even though there is, you know, entertainment and pump room and, and all kinds of, uh, of um, uh, concerts, uh, part of the self-publicity of the town is based on Chetnam being more of the associated with a, um, countryside quiet life. Now there is another level, uh, whoops, I'm trying to move on, there you go, uh, of spas and that's the second category category and I call them local spas. Uh, here I've registered uh, spas that enjoyed a reputation in their surroundings and sometimes beyond were regularly supported by noble patronage. It could be the object of one or several treatises, could be the subject of one poem or a play. 
and were invested in, they were trying to invest in their housing capacity for new visitors. Very often it's a problem. And in some facilities to provide additional entertainment, such as balls, plays, or concert. Dulwich in Lewisham or Matlock in Derbyshire, Landred Wells in Wales were all reasonably attractive, quite in fact dependent on the will of a few local people for their maintenance, rather than on an organized corporation as they would often be in the previous category. And occasional distinguished visitors were recorded and celebrating, him, you know, helping the spa to improve their status. An example of this is Islington Spa near London, also called the New Tunbridge Wells. And uh, there's in fact a network of competition between Tunbridge, Islington and also uh, Sadler's Wells. And Sadler's Wells is also in Islington. And uh, uh, of course, especially for this spa, it was closer to London, so more accessible than Tunbridge. It offered similar Calibia waters but you can see that people were gathering outside of the spa. Uh, and th therefore there is some degree of porosity between public space and the space of the spa. Uh, I think this entails a, a high degree of social mixity, which made these type, type of spas in the second category, perhaps a little more uh, dangerous in the representation of them. And uh, for this song, The Charms of Disabillé, is in fact about Newton Bridge Wells or Islington Spa, it's the same spa, and it celebrates uh, the light manners of uh, the women in, in Islington Spa. A third category is uh, really the largest. It consisted in local, very local wells or springs that would occasionally be provided with extra installation to access the water, perhaps a shed to protect visitors from the rain, a rail, a stone wall around the well, for example. Some of them were located in the close environment of our more established spa towns, while others could be lost in the woods or in the hills of a mining area such as the multiple wells of Yorkshire invented by Thomas Short in 1734. The reputation of some of these wells could extend beyond the local clientele when the waters were thought to have specific medicinal properties. St. Mungo's Well in Yorkshire, reputed to cure children's diseases, was regularly mentioned in early 18th century treatises on cold waters. Now, these categories uh, could be refined by uh, distinguishing a number of local permanent inhabitants and the number of visitors. Uh, in, in his investigation between the rural and urban status of spa towns, Peter Borsa insists on their size and capacities. Of the 173 spas Phyllis Hembury catalogues and founded, he says, a great many were located in villages and hamlets that could never have contained more than a handful of inhabitants. Even spas of some significance were often only small. And I think this perspective really enables us, and this, this map is a work in progress. There actually are more spas than this, and especially more sp smaller spas. Um, uh, I think it gives us a perspective on the accessibility of mineral waters. It does tell you that locally there is a, 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 mineral, a mineral water place you could go to, to drink the water, bathe it perhaps, and how widespread the practice could have been. Now I'm go going to give you one example of such a small spa, and it's the, the example of Bromley, Bromley Well. It was on the premises of an aristocrat in Kent who decided once the waters had been found uh, that uh, out of philanthropy, uh, he would let uh, the, the people access the waters. But I think there is a, and I need to investigate further and I would be interested in your feedback as well. There is some degree of ambiguity on, is this actually philanthropy or, did people 
I mean, did owners have to op open the access to mineral waters when they were situated on their land? And I need to do further, you know, uh, historical investigation into this. Um, for Bromley Whale, what's, in, what's interesting is that it's an ancient stopped up well, which was rediscovered. So together with the re-emergence of the waters, it's going to be written about and analyzed in a different way, found out to be mineral because of chemical analysis, and then made use of. And that therefore there is a local engagement around the memory and the history of environmental resource through mineral waters. Now, uh, my fourth category is uh, something that uh, people who do not work on spas are very often disagree with. So, uh, but people who work on spas tend to agree with and not trying to seduce you here, <laughs> you may disagree. Uh, I, for the long 18th century, which is the period that I'm working on, I have chosen to include seaside resorts in uh, the bulk of spa towns or watering places. I think uh, in, the early, in the 18th century, there is definitely a continuum between mineral waters and sea waters. Uh, the seaside resorts were also listed on Andrew's map in 1797. There is this famous dissertation concerning the use of seawaters in the disease of the glands um, in uh, 1743 by Russell. But also uh, there is evidence that seawater was prescribed and drunk in the early 18th century. I mean, throughout the whole 18th century, even sold in bottles. And therefore, the, their use is similar, I find, to the use of uh, spa, uh, spa water. It also enables me, including seaside resorts, to talk about sand ditton. And uh, I, would not, I would have been very sad if I had to exclude sand ditton from my corpus. And uh, as you know, sand ditton is Jane Austen's unfinished novel on the seaside resort at the turn of the 19th century. And it stages the hubris associated with spa development. A little, uh, little pause here. It's really something I'd like to organize a conference around uh, because I think that there is this notion of hubris and failure and disproportionate spa investments in the, you know, across Europe and not just in the 18th century, that would be wonderful to, to bring together and talk about as a, as a common throat, uh, trope around spas. Now to come back to Sanditon, uh, here's an excerpt from the book where the, the protagonist, Mr. Parker, is talking about the, the, his closest competition, Brinshaw, uh, it's another seaside resort which has just opened. But, but Brinshaw, sir, which I dare say you have in your eye the attempts of two or three speculating people about Brinshaw this last year to raise that paltry hamlet, lying as it does between a stagnant march, a bleak moor, and the constant effluvia of a ridge of petrifying seaweed, can end in nothing but their own disappointment. What in the name of common sense is to recommend Grinshaw? A most insalubrious air, rose proverbially detestable, water, brackish beyond example, impossible to get a good dish of tea within three miles of the place. Uh, the murky waters are here, uh, talking about brackish waters as well. And of course, the, the early competition between those rising seaside resorts is at the heart of Senditon. Uh, a quick comment on the adaptation. I found the, the um, adaptation by Davis, which was uh, um, uh, broadcasted with ITV in 2019, which takes a, a postcolonial interpretation on the novel and finishes it chose to you know finish the plot line and there were many debates around this uh, 
very interesting also for the materiality and the historical work that was done around it. And one of the aspects of it is the way that it reverses the traditional representation of nudity. Uh, in Rollinson's caricature on Margate, it is of course women who are naked and men peeping at them from the shore. Whereas in, uh, in Sanditon, uh, uh, the women are, you know, uh, going into the water, into the seawater, fully closed, and the habit it re really resembles the the bathing suits that they had at the time. Whereas men are going there naked in the water, and there's a whole uh, problem at some point where uh, one of the of the characters has to uh, undress on the beach, and he finally chooses to reach out the others, and you can see this on the picture. All right, so that's for seaside resorts. Now, if you take uh, this, you know, sorry, one of the interests of working on plurality of spare towns is that it shifts your perspective on the whole territory of 18th century Britain, I find. If you consider the density of wells and spas in London, for example, it makes sense to call London a spare town. It's a little provocative perhaps, but it, it makes sense. The pro proliferation of the London spas in the 18th century was the product of both conjectural and geological causes. First, the developing success of spas from other regions attracted the citizens of London out of town inspired several investors in the metropolis to seek profit from such an interest in mineral waters. Medieval holy wells no longer used since the Reformation reappeared. Some were rediscovered in forgotten cellars. Secondly, the geological premises of the British capital and its surrounding counties were exceptionally fertile in mineral water sources. Uh, this makes us reframe the relationship between center and periphery in the 18th century. Places like Richmond, Islington or Hampstead, um, and here I quote Elizabeth McKellar, these places perpetrated a rustic environment redolent of the healthiness and tranquility, even paradoxically, as this was being undermined by the large number of townspeople who flocked to them. It's a paradox which I find still very much alive today and uh, very interesting in reconsidering uh, uh, spa towns in the urban spaces. So I'm going to drink a little. So once I've tried to define all this in my introduction, and, and it's a definition that goes through the whole book, I want to give you a quick overview of the rest of the book. And I spent two chapters on spas as places on, of cure and care. And the reason why I've devoted the, those two chapters to medicine in spas is, um, I think derives from my attention to smaller spas and wells and my own bias for the history of medicine, of course. In places like St. Mungo, Bromley, which I quoted, or smaller spas of Yorkshire, spa users and local drinkers who have no leisurely activities around the well still come and drink. And therefore they're coming to use the water for health purposes and the wells are recorded and maintained for the health benefits that you can get from them. In the history of medicine, mineral water treatises have, have often been approached as one category, often spurred by the unabashed promotional motivations of water doctors who would seek to promote their waters and offer their services. Now, I think that such promotional strategy uh, cannot be reduced to water medicine and spas and, you know, concerns all the branches of 18th century medicines. That's the first point. But also water medicine was developing in various ways in 18th century Britain and should not be considered as promotion in disguise only. Just as there were a great variety of spas, medical account for the curative effects of mineral waters varied and overlapped. The changing status of chemistry, the development of the analysis of the waters is often put forward as a particular trend 
of the 18th century, and it's easy to verify in the proliferation of treatises of mineral waters. But even the most thorough chemical analysis do not exclude other referential frameworks to account for the effects of the waters. A mechanical approach emphasizing the circulation of inner fluids was still commonly invoked by medical doctors, especially in the case of cold water bathing, highly promoted in the first part of the century, as John Floyd's book on cold bathing shows. But also humoral approaches persisted throughout the century, justifying the need for the kinds of evacuations that waters provided from almost instant purging, which is the target of much satire in all kinds of satire, uh, visual satire, to intense sweating, which is mentioned by uh, Humphrey Clinker, uh, by, in the book Humphrey Clinker by Matthew Brumble. Whatever the referential framework, medical doctors all agreed on one thing. The role of the physician was crucial in evaluating a proper course of the waters and patients who took the waters with no prescription run a high risk to their health, if not their lives. This is not particular to the 18th century and it had existed before. Marilyn Nicou shows this for France as early as the late medieval period uh, where uh, medical uh, doctors started writing on the waters in the 14th centuries. But it's still very much present in a trope of every medical treatise is in the 18th century. Now, um, an aspect of 18th century mineral waters that needs to be worked on later, and I, I don't dwell much of it on it in my book, um, and which will be crucial to the development of 19th century mineral water is the gradual separation of on-site visiting and therapeutic use. Uh, it happened in several ways, the development of bottled waters, as Sylvia McIntyre argues, enables many patients to take the waters prescribed from the, by their doctors from home, especially the waters from the continent in Britain. You know, the German spa from spa or pool water were particularly successful and a growing trade developed around them. Similarly, salt extracted from the mineral waters of Chetnam or Epsom were sold, inserted in sweets, used for the creation of artificial mineral waters as well. And among them, artificial mineral waters developed in many towns uh, and you can find a, a good example of this is the waters of Barège, which come from the Pyrenean, but were recreated in France, but in Britain as well. And sometimes prescribed, I'm, you could be tempted to think, so if you take the artificial waters of Barège, then you don't go there anymore. But what's interesting is that many of them are prescribed before patients went to the real place. So you could take a course of the waters of Barège at home and then move to Barège in the Pyrenean for the summer. Uh, I have not had time to go into the types of diseases that the waters were curing. I'm happy to discuss it further. Uh, suffice it to say for now that writing the history of mineral waters, as you know, is an entry into the history of chronic diseases and long-term treatment and the history of relief. All right. Uh, in the third, fourth and fifth chapter of my book are mostly based on spa towns from the first and second category most of the time, again, other than Bath, although some remarks also concern smaller wells. As I delved into spa literature, I have read many local miscellanies, spa comedies, spa scenes in novels, some periodicals, even though much remains to be done on that part, which were related to specific spa towns. And one of the most represented spa town in literature is Tunbridge Wells, uh, the Tunbridge Miscellanies uh, or Tunbridge Delia are a good primary source to explore the discourse on gender politics within spa town. So here you can see that it's part of the chapter of, on gender and sexuality. 
and I tried to explain how spa literature used the setting of spa town as an imaginary space to explore and play with the conventions around gender and sexuality. Uh, there is a so um, I will read uh, an excerpt from a, a letter from Tunbridge to a friend in London, being a character of the Wells and Company there, and it's not it's not the one at the bottom; it's the one uh, in the in the on the top. My fancy was diverted to the water, where the distinctions of sex and condition are concealed and where the mixture of men and women has given occasion to some persons of light imagination to compare Bath to the fountain of Salmasis, which had the virtue of joining the two sexes in one person, or to the stream where, wherein Diana washed herself when she bestowed the horns on Actium. Now there's a long history to this particular letter from a friend uh, to letter from Tun Tunbridge to a friend in London. Uh, I first found it in a miscellany, then found it, it had been reprinted from a, a periodical, uh, which was uh, Richard Steele's uh, periodical, uh, um, the, I can't find the name right now, but it will come back to me. Um, it will come back to me, sorry, Steele's periodical. But then the reviewer for my book said, well, in fact, I found it in an earlier miscellany, a packet from Wells. And I think it's quite typical of the type of literature that I have been dealing with around Spartan. It's, uh, it's always rewritten, uh, people self-plagiarize or plagiarize, adapt previous uh, letters and adapted to an, another spa town and just changed the name. So there is the circularity of, of um, those texts from one, one miscellany to another, which is quite interesting for the culture of spa town. I was interested here in the trope around hermaphroditis and the experience of bathing as potentially threatening to one's gendered identity. Of course, there is an anxiety over gender roles and confusion. In spa miscellanies, you find many criticism of the type of habits, riding habits, uh, which are deemed masculine and, and worn by women in spa town. Um, and uh, of course, um, uh, what is threatened here is the unlooker's ability to assign gender and distinguish gender. And it's, it's related to this, I think also what, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of my colleague, but she, she mentioned um, last time on 18th century German spa towns, uh, she mentioned spas as heterotopias. So places where, because you were more relaxed and because conventions were not as strict, you could reinvent oneself. And I think that to a certain extent, for first and second category spa towns, uh, around the questions of genders, this is, this is true and an interesting lead. Um, I was talking about circulating discourse. Do I, do I still have a little time or? Yeah, okay. Uh, and gossip is uh, an, an activity <laughs> that is very much reported in spa towns. And I, I looked at it in my fourth chapter entitled Pump Room Politics, because I think that gossip is an interest, has an interesting geographic dynamic. It is local, it contributes to the organization of power, as well as of local counterpower. And there is a specific seasonal and collective organization in primary and uh, secondary spa towns, which is a fertile ground for gossip. So in spa comedies, which is a, a, a type of comedies that is set in a spa and you find around 20 of them uh, in, in 18th century Britain, I don't know whether it's a specific genre or not, it, it can be discussed. But in all these comedies, certainly gossip is, is the target of much satire. For example, one of the characters in Sheridan's 
a trip to Scarborough, talks about his friend that he's going to uh, uh, reach at the theater and is saying, there's my lady tattle, my lady prate, my lady titter, my lady sneer, my lady giggle, my lady grin. These are boxes in the front and while any favorite air is singing, all are the prettiest company in the world, stop my battles. Um, in another scene, in another spat comedies, uh, it's Baker's Tunbridge Walk, so the Yeoman of Kent. Uh, Reynard uh, talks to his sister and they, they are, you know, reaching uh, his sister at the wells. And here's what he tells her. How goes scandals at the wells today? What fine lady had an intrigue last night, which the rest out of envy has reported? And she replies, rather, sir, what intrigues have your vanity boasted of, which neither of you persons nor accomplishment had forced to gain you? So all this, you know, are examples of, of how gossip is dealt with. Um, and uh, in fact, um, um, there is an analysis on gossip in the 18th century that shows that gossip is, is also a way of maintaining um, uh, intimate relationship uh, within a particular circle of friends. And I think in the seasonal context of spas, gossip could really have this function and, and has therefore this positive, positive social function. Now, it, uh, what is mostly known about gossip in 18th century spas is the way it was regulated by Bonash in 18th century Bath and Tunbridge Wells, because Bonash, who had been his master of ceremonies at Bath for a long time, uh, also in the second part of his professional life, turned to Tunbridge Wells and was master of ceremonies in both places. Those who know the context of Bath will tell me he was not exactly master of ceremonies because he was not uh, hired by the corporation. And this is true, we'll turn to this after, afterwards, but he acted as a master of ceremonies. And uh, Goldsmith, Oliver Goldsmith, the, the playwright and, and novelist, wrote Life of Richard Nash, and it's a very lively uh, account of his uh, life. And he uh, gives an account of the regulation in the pump room of Bath and gives this particular account on gossip that all whisperers of lies and scandals be taken for their authors, that all repeaters of such lies and scandal be shunned by all company, except such as have been guilty, uh, sorry, expect such as have been guilty of the same crime. A Nash, a well-known uh, pump room regulation, goes against the image of another earlier master of ceremonies at Tunbridge Wells, whom Rachel Johnson has spoken about, called Belle Cousy. Belle Cousy or Cousy, I don't know how to pronounce her name, was early in the 18th century uh, organizing ceremonies at Tunbridge Wells, and she's represented in literature as using gossip to her own ends and to, to, in fact, to obtain power because people would be afraid that she would repeat secret stories about them. Since we're talking about Master of Ceremonies, uh, I can turn to um, Bo Nash and uh, give, uh, uh, it gives me an opportunity to mention the role of gambling in spa towns. I will not go into one of my big interests, which is the Affaire des Jeux de Spa, uh, which is a tension between the ridottos of Spa in Belgium that potentially led to the Liège Revolution. But I would be delighted to hear more if you're also interested in that subject. But it's only fair to say that the role of gambling has often contributed to give a particular financial identity to spa towns as places of cutthroat venture capitalism, money laundering, murky financial dealings. Uh, this was already true in the 18th century, as also as Oliver Goldsmith explains in his Life of Nash. Um, 
he established a strict, uh, sorry, he explains that even though Nash had established a strict regulation for gamblers and cast away all the sharpers from the gambling tables, he was profiting from quiet agreements with the bankers. And I have included here a display of the cards to play Pharaoh, which, and Pharaoh is a, a game where you bet on, on cards and the banker give you according to your bet, but it's easy to cheat at Pharaoh. And here's what Goldsmith says. But I hear the reader now demand what finances were to support all this finery, because as I said earlier, he was not hired by the corporation. Or where are the treasures that gave him such frequent opportunities of displaying his benevolence or his vanity? The question leads to a darker part of the character of Bonash. By gaming alone at that period of which I speak, he kept it so very genteel an appearance when he first figured at Bath that there were few laws against this destructive amusement. The gaming table was a constant resource of despair and indigence and the frequent ruin of opulent fortunes. And I forgot to put the other part of the quote here where he explains that he actually benefited for, from gambling. So he's one of those two-faced characters that the 18th century novelists are fascinated with and really attracted uh, uh, attention in, in novels. Uh, because I have little time left, I will now move on to uh, the, the end of my fourth chapter on national politics, where I mentioned the, the case of one of my favorite wells in Britain, which I haven't had a chance to visit because of COVID, St. Winifred in Wales. And it is tempting to consider that mineral waters were medicalized in the 18th century, leaving little room for religious beliefs and practices, which was often considered as an earlier mode of approaching healing waters. In Britain, this idea was reinforced by the fact that holy wells were destroyed um, in the aftermath of Reformation together with monasteries. However, there were persisting use of some holy wells in several areas of Britain. St. Winifred in Wales is uh, perhaps one of the most striking examples of the persistence of Welsh Catholic faith into the 18th century, which did not exclude Anglican users to resort to the water as well. Of course, most of these wells were criticized and sometimes even closed, as it happened regularly in Ireland, we will see. However, the reality of the multiple uses of mineral waters is that there were coexisting religious frames, blending some Catholic legends with contemporary accounts of miracle cures. And Alex Walsham, when talking about the history of holy wells and holy waters, talks of Protestant magic, quote unquote, to show how the dominating culture incorporated some long lasting beliefs in miraculous waters. And I think it's an interesting lead into the history of mineral waters as well. Now to end on, uh, uh, it's not quite the end, I have one more slide and then we're done. Um, then to follow a lead from these holy wells into the question of colonial spas, which was so admirably presented by Eric Jennings uh, two sessions ago. Uh, and I know that Amanda Herbert is also doing a, a fabulous work on colonial spas in the early modern, modern context and the use of people of African descent uh, of the spas in Jamaica, for example. I think within Britain, there is also colonial politics that can be approached around spas. And uh, I found an example of them in the ways in which holy wells are trying to be recuperated in Ireland. Uh, John Richardson, when he writes The Great Folly Superstition, the Idolatry of Pilgrimage in Ireland, is on a mission to uh, work on the conversion of Irish Catholics to Anglican church. But he goes to the extent of learning to speak Gaelic and trying to meet uh, Irish people and understand their practices. But his book is actually quite, uh, exemplifies the type of rationalism that is colonialism in disguise. And he talks about pilgrims 
who are using the waters of St. Patrick Wells, and I still have to situate this particular well. I think it's in County Mees, but there are so many St. Patrick Wells in, in Ireland that it's, it's hard to, to situate at the moment. Uh, so he talks about the pilgrims as people who run barefoot and barehead with uh, their beads in one hand and a stick like a cross. And it's, it, 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 he doesn't put the word cross, it's a cross as uh, written as this, printed as this in the book, in the other. And um, he talks also about their uncouth un uh, practices. Uh, they drink pr plentifully of the water, which is purging, and impregnated with some mineral. And then he goes on to talk about the mineral, which is the, the p potential explanation for the healthy benefits of these waters. And he moves then on to uh, explaining the legend that is attached to this wells, saying that uh, there was a monster, which was basically a, a giant worm, which uh, was which swallowed uh, um, uh, an Irish hero, Conan, who then cut his head from the inside. And having cut off his head, the monster immediately died. That's the quote. And Conan threw it upon the shore where the stones were colored red with blood that gushed out of it, as the natives believe, whereas it is obvious to observe that it is a mineral spring flowing over them that gives them this color. And there's the same discussion around the waters of St. Winifred because St. Winifred's head was cut off and put back on by St. Bruno and the, the pebbles at the bottom of the well are also said to be red and therefore tainted with the blood of St. Winifred and it's the Calibriate waters, uh, the, the, the authors explain that gives them their taint. So this medicalization of, of the holy wells here also serves the purpose of um, reducing Catholic beliefs to um, um, primitive beliefs and asserting a, a colonial politics around the wells. Now to end on a lovely caricature, a summer amusement, which is, you know, uh, it, it is a um, reference to the summer, summer amusement, uh, the series of spa books around major spas of the continent, Les Amusements des Jeux de Spa, Les Amusements d'Aix-la-Chapelle. Here, the summer, summer amusement is to find the bed bugs uh, in the bed. And spa lodgings are uh, really um, a recurrent problem in spa literature. And I think that uh, they're quite representative of the spas as a setting for the prosperity gap between rich and poor visitors, but also between poor locals and rich visitors who expect more from the logic sign that they should visit when visiting the spas. In uh, the famous letter I was telling you about earlier, uh, here's what the, the narrator says. My landlord was a farmer and his very outhouse were so full that having sheared some sheep, he abated me half a crown a week to let the wool lie in my bedchamber, by which means a tick one night had buried himself so far in my belly that I was forced next morning to borrow shoemaker's pincers to pluck the bloodthirsty vermin out of his nest by the arse. Now, um, uh, this funny little uh, sentence is really just one example among many on the, the condition of accommodation in spas. And I think it's quite typical. It's a very 18th century thing uh, because spas were in such expansion and also sometimes short-lived uh, to, to have this, this accommodation problem. And it's the discomfort associated with them denotes, I think, a larger anxiety, you know, over inns and lodgers that spread through the whole 18th century. Spa visitors are displaced, they're out of their comfort zones, which brings excitement, but also fear, cure, but also discomfort. And it is within this murky place, this ambivalence that dwells the whole approach of my book. So now I'm open to talk more about any question that you might have.
Thank you very much indeed, Sophie. Thank you. I, I switched off my camera because I had uh, a, a very unstable internet link, but I do hope that I have uh, uh, heard uh, everything that you said so that I'd be able to, uh, to uh, medical, religious, uh, social and uh, literary uh, discourses about spa Astrid. Astrid, I think you better switch off the camera again. You're frozen. Interesting that you started. Now she's gone. Ah, she did Absolutely. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. but please keep the uh, the camera off because you were frozen. Now? Okay, I'm sorry. It's... We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Now we yeah. can hear you. you. You have to repeat, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. I found it very interesting that you started with this fascinating map from uh, 1797. Uh, to start with, I thought this is impossible because this is what we deal with in the 19th century, this enormous mushrooming of spa. Um, when be, uh, what uh, this cartographer has done, cartographer has done, he hasn't um, given us the spa our towns. He's given us the wells or the kind of the water sources, wells and 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 uh, uh, seaside further down. He's not talking about spa towns, but about about spas. Um, and I found that you, you had a, a very interesting way of dealing with this by introducing your four categories, yeah, and the uh, seaside resort. Uh, just to say from our project, we entirely agree. Uh, we too have the seaside resorts as an integral part of our work. Yes, uh, like you, we see that they belong together. They have been developed yeah, uh, out of each other and we, we look at them uh, uh, together. Um, so you gave us these, uh, these four categories, yeah? national, uh, local, uh, small and seaside uh, and made a number of observations, which I found very interesting. Um, one of my questions would be coming here from a comparative point of view, uh, talking about European spas, uh, can we uh, apply this scheme that you have uh, given us here to European spas, to continental spas? Um, that is one thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the other thing is, um, so, so you, you sort of two and then number three and four saying that uh, number one and two, so lo uh, national and local, could be classified in the uh, Lotz Heumann sense as heterotopias. Yes. Um, I wonder, I mean, if we go down the, uh, uh, that, the, that division, then I wonder what, what do you think about uh, that category four, about uh, 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 seaside resorts? Yes. Um, and then the next point is, what are these small spas? Are they, yeah, yeah, are we talking about a spa society? Are we talking about spa life and uh, a dietetic system uh, of uh, taking the water um, that we have developed in the 18th century elsewhere and that needs the, the environment, it doesn't only need the well or the, the, say the, the sea, it needs the environment, it needs the promenade, it needs the meeting spaces, it needs, as you mentioned before, the, the music and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I want to inquire just a little more into your uh, four categories and how far uh, they help us uh, and how far uh, they don't, and also in how far they can be applied to continental Europe. Um, and I'd also like to have an, uh, or sort of ask for another comparison, and that is, of course, the, the work 
workings of spa society as the master of ceremony is something decidedly British. We do not have this. I have not come across this anywhere else. Um, and I, uh, it's probably those two, those questions with which I would like to start uh, and like, yeah, to, like you to, um, to respond uh, to them. And then we open the floor to everyone else. Thank you so much um, for these questions, which are very inspiring. Um, can we apply this scheme to continental spas? So it's a scheme that really helped me figure out this bulk. I, just very quickly, I'm going to share my current uh, work with you. So this is my database, you know, of spas in the 18th century, and currently it's it is. Uh, it's only the second category, but if I select them all, you know, that's what I have. I really have around 300. Um, so I needed to understand what was going on because, you know, I started this project very... Uh, um, oh, can you see? No, you can't see. No, Sorry. we can't see it yet. Can you oh, see yeah. now? This looks like a, yeah, long spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. And these are some, I'm trying to, you know, I, I have the, 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 I was able to find their, their place each time, and give the, the data, the geographic data for them. And, you know, I very, I just embarked this. I was genuinely thinking, you know, well, I will deal with the, 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 the spas that are not bars. And that was so, there, there is my hubris. <laughs> Uh, I didn't realize I would be faced with so many spas. I didn't realize that. So I had to figure out things and, and try and categorize them for my own use, really. Uh, I think when I think of France, because I'm working on France with François Zanetti uh, and on Barège specifically, there are other categories emerging and, and you're right to talk about climatic. I saw someone, uh, I think Enrique, yeah, climatic resorts. Uh, do, I don't know whether they, I don't think they exist so much in, at least in 18th century Britain, but they are certainly rising at the end of 18th, the, the 18th century in France. And the mountains on the continents are much higher and, and you know, they, that's another entry into the spa so that, that I don't think it could be transferred directly but I think that work trying to map spas actually makes you shift your focus and that's that's in, it's an interesting work and that's also what, what we're trying to do with France we're trying because there are so many primary sources associated with, did with them and they're also endangered right now and there's no way to access them easily so that's it's it's a like a very difficult uh, long-term work that needs to be done. So that's a question, an answer to this. Uh, what are the small spas if they're not heterotopias? About heterotopia, so it was Foucault's text that made me think about this. And as always with Foucault, I'm always very inspired and very annoyed at the same time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy and annoyed to recognize that it works but I'm also finding the limit of this, this term. And even for, even for the major spas, I think that a lot of spa visitors were extremely sick and they were not reinventing themselves. They were trying to get some relief uh, for the everyday pain that they endured. And some of the cases described by medical doctors of people coming in, you know, lying down from the, the, the other side of the country, uh, not being able to walk at all, uh, is really a sign that it's not just a place uh, of leisure. Um, so, but in terms of, you know, the gender politics and, and when you start focusing on entertainment, et cetera, and, and, and relationship with the body, it is an interesting lead, even you know, in, in the, the, the larger spa towns. About the smaller spa towns, um, there seems to be a degree, uh, and sometimes a high degree of social life there as well. Sometimes it is religious, it's based on religious, for example, some, some wells, which are considered also as having mineral waters, 
could be visited on, on St. Pantone's Day and, and blending in religious rites and um, medical uh, uh, rituals. You could call them like that. So there, there were some social interactions around them. Uh, I think I showed also the, the picture of Islington Spa because I think that there are some gardens, like partly improvised gardens around them, which are not necessarily a pump room or a promenade, but, you know, giving some degree of social interaction and interaction with the environment. And then there are the, the, the wells and, and springs that are lost in the woods or, <laughs> or in the countryside or near a village. And these seem to be, um, I don't know, there was an interesting uh, description of a cold spring where people would come in the morning and with a bucket or something and get the spring and plunge themselves in the bucket. And they talk of women handling children there. So meaning that there would be, and again, I wanted to mention the call for papers that you put and I think invisible, you know, uh, workers at the spa is such an interesting topic because there were, were definitely women there taking the children, punning, dipping them in the water, giving them back to their parent or their tutor or whatever. And so that they could go back. So there was some kind of social setting of some kind there, uh, but definitely not on the very organized urban lines of bigger spare towns. I don't think there was another question so far. Yeah. Um, the master of ceremony. Oh, yes. Ha. Huh. Uh, so Rachel Johnson is working on them and she, she wrote a thesis on, on uh, uh, spa and seaside resorts in Kent. And she, she worked also on Belle Colsey, which is such an interesting character. Um, I didn't know there weren't any master of ceremonies on the continent. So that's an interesting aspect for me. Uh, I th as it grew through the 18th century, it seems that master of ceremonies were hired by corporations. Dickie Dickinson is certainly hired by uh, the corporation in Scarborough. And there was a whole, um, you know, John Anklin wrote a book on Bonash, which he called the imaginary autocrat. But Dickie Dickinson and, uh, is also represented as a, as a monarch in, his, in the town of Scarborough. Uh, not Dickie Dickinson, I'm sorry, I'm confused. No, yes, it is Dickie Dickinson. Uh, and so I think there were also, there was a political discourse around them and around their authority, which was disputed and satirized as much as it, as it was uh, so as much as their company was sold for. Um, now I would need to see how things were organized for, ser for, for balls and everything on the continent to be able to compare uh, master of ceremonies and, and how things were done on the continent. I'm not aware of this yet. I'm open for other questions. Yes, so now it's my turn. I'm taking over the questions because Astrid has this very unsecure internet connection. And I'm having a look at the chat. So if you want to pose a question, please write your name in the chat and I will have a look on the order of the questions. And we have already queuing some people, queuing some people here for a question. The first one is Thomas from der Dunk, and then we have Alex, and after that it's Christian's turn. So please, Thomas. Yes, I hope uh, there will be no second thunder now in Amsterdam, there just was. <laughs> <laughs> very heavy. Uh, uh, just two very short questions. Uh, what percentage of the population 
did go to a spa in Britain, one out of 100, one out of 1,000, one out of 10,000. And the second question is, what percentages of the spa visitors was foreign in Britain? Is it known for the time, for the, for the period? What was foreign? Yeah, foreign, that, coming from, yeah. from the continent or elsewhere. So, so I will answer the <laughs> second question first, because it's yeah. easier. Um, the the I think foreign visitors went mostly to the seaside resorts of the south of England, such as Brighton or Brighton, and to Bath. Uh, however, when uh, Elizabeth Montague talks about Scarborough, she she writes a very um, angry depiction of the town, saying, "Well." You can't even speak English in this town, you know, everyone speaks a different language. So she does refer to some degree of cosmopolitanism in Scarborough, which is very annoying to her. But Scarborough, again, has this particular situation on the sea. Uh, so could be probably accessed by boat. Um, within uh, England, Places like Buxton or, or um, Harrogate, I did not find as many foreign visitors as when I read about bourbon l'Archambault in France, for example. It does not seem to be as spread out. And many English visitors went to the continent, as you know. Spa was the first destination, certainly. But they go to the Pyrenees, they go to Vichy, and they, they visit, they, throughout the Grand Tour, they also spot, stop us several spa towns. So I think it's much truer in the other sense that English visitors are going to the continent. And here you can see me avoiding uh, answering the question on percentage, uh, because I have no systematic review of, of visitors. But I think that at some point, if I were launching into a, a more serious, uh, uh, like collective project on British spas, I would have to work with people who have been done doing statistics on the 18th century to have a better vision of that. Um, on people visiting spas in, within Britain, I guess just doing the math of how many spas in Wales I can find compared to the population of, in Britain then could give me some kind of idea. And I should do, I, thanks for suggesting this. I, I would certainly do it, <laughs> but I can't, I can't answer quite now. I do find that, you know, you, you, could, you could go to a spa within a, a few miles from your hometown. And that's also the math that I need to do. So it, it, it feels that it was quite a common practice, but it's just an intuition, sorry, not to be exact. So it's not absolutely upper class. It's, it's oh, not no. oh no, that, no, absolutely not. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. Because <laughs> that's for sure. There are so many ways in which it is not. Yeah. Um, three examples, St. Winifred, uh, so in St. Winifred, people would hang their um, crutches in the trees surrounding the well to show that they would have been cured, which is very much of a folk practice. It's not an elite practice to do that. I mean, there could have been, you know, uh, crutches in encrusted with jewels, but I don't believe it so much. Uh, uh, you could have thing. hung your servants that carried you there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well. The servants also are said to take the, wa the waters from themselves. That's a problem in Chetnam, which is reported saying, well, they're getting the waters for their masters to bring back the waters at home. But before that, they drink the waters for themselves. So that's, there's a big you know, tension around them. But also when uh, as medical doctors write about spas, I, I have a particular example in mind where um, uh, Linden, who actually came from Germany and, and uh, from Westphalia and, and uh, was a, a water doctor in Ireland and in England. He writes about uh, one of the spas in London and talks about 
a, um, a black boy who had been brought to the spa and who was a servant to uh, so-and-so and who's, uh, who was being cured by the waters there because he, was, he had the yaws. And so there was this practice of uh, using mineral waters and also lots of complaints of poor people not knowing how to drink properly and therefore and, and endangering their health with too much purge. So, yeah. Okay, the next is friend, uh, Alex, please. Uh, thanks very much, Sophie, for a fascinating uh, overview and um, especially for taking us beyond Bath um, and indeed beyond the Bath um, to um, give us such an interesting typology. Yeah. When I was listening to the first half of the talk, I was wondering whether religion would come up, but then it came up in a very rich way um, uh, towards the end. So I was already thinking, and you've already just been discussing it um, now. I happen to know Holy Well quite well because my English family lives nearby, and I also know a good friend who knows the history of it from the Reformation, post-Reformation point of view. But these places will be very different across um, uh, different regions of England and maybe different focuses yeah. of, of non-conformism. And yeah. also the survival of um, the survival of magic. We talk about the decline of magic with Keith Thomas, and we have sometimes a little bit of a teleological narrative. I thought that also last week, although the paper was excellent, um, you know, the secularization, regimentation, and we ignore religion um, yeah. in this. So I'm very um, glad that you um, raised the topic. My question is more specific now. Um, I wonder if it might be necessary or possible to distinguish between spas and wells. Um, you talked about incorporating seaside resorts into a spa typology, and I accept that, but I wonder if these wells are a, a different phenomenon. And it might be interesting also for your quantitative work to think about categories. Yeah. Yes, I think because I come from the medical uh, culture, and that's where, that's where I first started, started studying spas, that's why I you know, I didn't even ask myself the questions. Of course, I would include wells because doctors talk about them, talk about their waters and talk about the, the cures uh, from all kinds of wells, uh, including discussing some of the holy wells. Uh, and, and I like, uh, I think my initial focus was water, not the town, not, not the, the infrastructure. And because of that, that's why I wanted to include the wells. Now, that being said, I, I was aware, um, I became aware uh, of this major holy well question in the whole of Britain and how it's approached in different places and how also, like I'm, I'm a member of the holy wells groups on Facebook and how people go on hikes and all the crowdsourcing that is being done, which is amazing around holy wells and how people are well read and, and, and you know, give in information, share it, and how it's also perhaps experienced as, as, as a commons, which some parts of the Sophie, I'm afraid you're stuck. But I feel that it's a major, could you? You must you repeat the last sentences because you were- Yeah. Sorry, I said that it felt like it was experienced as, as commons. You know, it's close to the question of commons and raises the question of the ownership of water and the ownership of the history of water. Uh, and that it's a major political point in, in British culture, which I was not aware of. And I think much more than spat down to some extent, you know, the, the wealth themselves. And therefore, Yes, there are a, a category which has its own identity because of all these questions. But when you look at the use of mineral waters, it would not make sense, I think, not to include wells, even though they, of course, have their own history and specificities. The terminology is also difficult because places like Sadler's Wells and Tunbridge Wells yeah. retain the name, but then they take on a completely different social function. So it's kind of, yeah. Sometimes the name is deceptive, yeah. Well, it's just that within a spa town, there can be a well, which is approached and represented as such. And yeah, yeah, no, but you're right, you're right. Yes, thank you for this suggestion question. Yes, thank you. So the next one is Christian. 
Yeah, I'm quite happy about sort of following up the discussion between Alex and Sophie because <clears throat> a lot of, of, of the questions that we raise, particularly in this project, in this comparative kind of perspective is relative chronologies, right? And I think for an, people, including the 18th century, this kind of distinction between holy or whatever kind of other wells and, and the emerging kind of spa culture looks totally different uh, than for a modernist coming back from the 19th or right. even the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So um, I do think to some degrees it's an, if you excuse academic question, because um, there is a potential of sources, wells or whatever, developing in it, into a spa or not, right? And, and this is exactly where my question lies. Sort of, um, usually you get um, the impression that um, England in particular is spearheading the development of leisure classes, capitalism and what have you. And you would have expected that um, in, or at least from, from drawing the analogy from the continent, that this kind of um, early development of, of leisure classes, of, of, of money available, of, of, of industries uh, developing in the north and so on and so forth, would also create something that we see a little later on the continent, which is this kind of spa boom, in which sort of creating a spa is a license for printing money at some stage, right? <laughs> sort of in the takeoff yeah. phase, somewhere between the 1820s, 30s, uh, and the mid-century, which is beyond your period, I know. But sort of from a continental view, you would expect that something similar should have existed then perhaps in England in the eight, 1780s, 90s. But somehow I didn't see that happening. You see, you, you make your distinction between the, the, the top group, right, where, where Bath is in, and Bath is clearly a forerunner and an example for the continent. But then there seemed to be a kind of disjuncture. And can you perhaps discuss that a bit? I think, um, I think that it's partly, again, partly due to the medical bias that I'm interested in practices around mineral waters. And because Peter Bosse had done it so well, and, and I didn't want to go into the urban discussion around spas. And mm -hmm. um, not that I didn't want to, but I didn't feel I had the, the knowledge and skills to discuss urban development. And I think your question is also... It's, it's more, it? no, it's more the entre entrepreneurial side, which which sort of uh, sparked up when you talked about the masters of ceremony, right? The, the, the question of the, the potential development. I mean, if you do this kind of typology, right? There seem to be these <coughs> simple folksy places. There seem to be the in-betweens with the development potential. And there seem to be sort of the top spas, right? And I think if you start with that, it, it has in, inherently a kind of question about the potential. Right, sort of. Why don't perhaps many of the, or do perhaps um, many of these third or second class spa uh, places develop or not develop? Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, particularly in, in the comparison to, as I said, continental Germany, where sort of at and, and we had this talk last, or the last talk two two weeks ago, right, where this question also came up. It's, it's sort of, um, it's local princes, it's sort of people who sort of developed the, or, or uh, discovered the, the economic potential that is in the spa business. Yeah. I, and you have, have you looked into smaller wells in Germany in the 19th century? Like do there, because, isn't there, uh, um, when you look at the, the, the history spas from the point of view of the, the patron, it seems that it does, you know, that it does make you think in terms of investment. But when you look at the history spas from the point of view of users and, and perhaps those who want to analyze, because I'm sure it's the same in, in the in the 19th century. Uh, some medical doctors really go on a long 
investigation to all the kinds of mineral waters they can find. And they really are trying to figure out what are the active principles. Then they are not really interested necessarily into investment and they are, they are looking at uses. They are, try, they are going to villages and say, oh, you have a spa nearby, okay, I'll go there and, and or get me some water. It's a, and they write to the Royal Society, etc. So it's a parallel story, which perhaps complexifies the history a little and, and gives, and there is a persisting, because it's true, I find this true in France as well, that in the yeah. 18th century, some spas are invested in and some spas are celebrated locally, but not invested in. They're, they're not all the, the object of furious investment or patronage. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, this is a, a, a very... <laughs> uh, no, sort of, I mean, I, I, I can see the point that you're taking and the perspective that you sort of, uh, that you've taken, but sort of, I mean, it, it is simply one of the, yeah, the open stories in, in the comparative history, right? And... Um, yeah. Perhaps it's one of the explanations. I mean, sort of in, in France, you have the, the, the centralized state who plays quite an important role, I guess, also in the 19th century in terms of channeling yeah. investments. For, yeah. um, in Germany, you have this, this more decentralized kind of potential and very interesting mm. kind of models of spa development, even of, mm. of smaller or less important places and, mm. and, and, and all the established spas very very quickly falling out of, of, of fashion, which, which yeah. can't be explained by the quality of their waters, right? And, no, no. And, 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 and as well, sort of, the other thing that intrigued me, and I sort of, I'm, I, I'm, I'm stopping now, but I, I could go on and on and on, and I think I send you, I'll send you long emails or ask for a, <laughs> for a private kind of yeah, yeah. reception. But, <laughs> My favorite um, conversation. Um, one of, <laughs> one of, of the things that, that intrigues me, like you seemingly, but perhaps from a later pers later time perspective is this this water business and uh, the bottling water, the selling of water. Yes. To our big surprise, I didn't know that before we started the project, it turns out that even in the, in the big spas in Germany, um, in the pump rooms, they were selling water from other spas. So you would ah, sort of take great. the take the advantage of going to Baden-Baden and could still drink yeah. your Carlsbad water. Yeah. So there are yeah. so crazy yeah. things That's going great. on. And uh, yes. so, mm. and that, and that ties in with, with, with what you said about sort of consuming the, the type of water before you go to the place, but sort of in terms of, of uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's use a, a modern word for it, branding, right? This is a really interesting story that needs further ex exploitation. Yes. And you could, I mean, artificial mineral waters are very interesting too, and they're really booming in the 18th century. And yeah. there are places at the end of the 18th century in Paris where you can take a bath of, you know, any spa town. Yeah. Uh, and they're kind of doing the composition again. So. Anyways, uh, I don't want to... Very interesting, yeah. Sorry to... for... <laughs> no, no, it's, I agree Loving with you. It's a too model. far away. So, Paul, you wanted to comment on something what Kristen said. Yeah, yes, thank you. And, and thank you, Sophie, for a great, a great talk. Um, um, I, I live and work in Bath and I work with a colleague called, <laughs> yeah, called Christopher Bath. No, no problem at all. Uh, many things are beyond Bath. Um, I love but, Bath. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my, my dear colleague Christopher Pound has spent the lockdown doing a, a very thorough gazetteer of the whole of England, Wales and Scotland of holy wells, village wells and spas um, and has come up now with a list of over 900 sites and he's tracked these all down on, on the first editions of our ordnance survey maps uh, and got, got a lot of detail and what's the, what what to uh, he and I believe that what led to the failure of a lot of the smaller spas, uh, the, the village spas that we talk about today, is very often a simple lack of investment, which C Christian was hinting at. And usually the local landowner got involved, uh, would often control the access to the wells and, and would uh, try and attract uh, a business, uh, uh, the aristocracy um, uh, and um, and would build villas 
And the first thing they tended to do was build villas because you needed some accommodation. But some of these failed very quickly within within two or three decades because no mm-hmm. further investment followed that. Um, and we have even just surrounding Bath, we have four or five examples of this: Holt and Melksham, um, and they just completely failed. And they really failed because of a not good accommodation and b no alternative activity. We call it the diversions. You didn't have a, an assembly room. You couldn't go dancing. Uh, you couldn't gamble. Um, and as, if that investment didn't follow very rapidly, these places failed and, re, and retained that small nature of a small village. Uh, and uh, Chris, uh, Chris, Christopher Pound has many examples of this. So we think it's very much equated with a failure to invest. Um, and if I may, may just make, make one other point, which you might care to comment on, is the early famous spas, and Bath is clearly one of them, but there are other examples uh, throughout England, is when the rich and the famous and the aristocrats were were turning up, they often felt guilty that the uh, poorer people could not access the waters. And there's many examples of charities being set up and funded by the rich and famous, um, uh, and they established hospitals for the poor, the elderly, and the infirm of the local community. Uh, and, and the uh, Baths had a hospital open since 1737, funded by yeah. a charity yeah. that Bo Nash established. And, and yeah. do you know many other examples of that sort of activity where, where the, the rich and the famous were funding uh, facilities for access for the poor and the elderly and, uh, and those of lesser means? So I I, um, I really like Anne Boss's book on on the general hospital in Bath. It's it's just it's really good and marvelous in the way the way that she describes the whole institution being set up and all the tensions around that hospital and as you're saying the the the, the philanthropy around it and. Mm. and the money problems. Well. Anyways, just to to and so I was looking for other hospitals at least in major spa towns Mm -hmm. but they seem it's it's still you know I'm happy to to learn more because it's it's still um, ongoing I did not focus on hospitals for this study Mm -hmm. but it seems more of a 19th century enterprise than an 18th century for England what was being done however is the uh, the um, subscription for the elite had a percentage that was then uh, given to to maintain sometimes another bath open to the poor yeah. or to to sponsor the use of uh, of uh, poor people who would come to the bath and who would um, uh, uh, be lodged in a certain way and have specific hours of visit at the common baths. So it it was developed in in various ways, and I could not tell you how which is which right now. But it seems to me that it's more of a of a subscription system in the 18th century than the development of hospitals. But to be confirmed, it's really something mm-hmm. that I'm trying to look into. As for uh, the lack of investment in smaller spare towns, I think it's completely true for a lot of them, but I would suggest perhaps two things. The first one is, as you're saying, near Bath, it was really hard to to become a major spare town because you were near Bath. So when you had a high competition from a nearby spare town, you had to invest really high, really quickly. To, to be to have find your identity and have many visitors. But some waters were quite specific, like very strong or found out to be very good for one specific use. And so sometimes medicinal properties helped some smaller spas to be maintained. And sometimes either religious identity or local identity made the spa or the well uh persist through the, for, throughout the the century so there were other models as well uh outside of the cl- classic investment model if I, I may just want to add a very quick point in in the medieval times in bath 
after the rich and famous had bathed in the water, the water went into a secondary uh, bath. Mm. And that's when the poor people could use it. But the water was second hand. It had already yeah. been used by somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. Thank you for your remark. Uh, if I may intervene, that was a story my grand aunt told coming from Germany as a child made to a, to a minister in Rotterdam that the whole family in the beginning of the 10th century went to Bath in the in the to the bathroom and in the same water and she had to go to go as as the latest mm. behind all the the children of the minister mm. <laughs> well it's the same in barrage you know barrage so in in uh, in france there's this interesting phenomenon of military spas uh and barrage is uh, is uh, known to help the cure of wounds and therefore a military spa and soldiers would go at night after a days uh, of use for the waters and before the waters were changed. So yeah, it's a longer tradition. Yes, Henrique's question has already been answered. She types and she wonders if we can steal the term of the network of competition from you for our project. <laughs> so what do you say? Really, you know what I find really interesting is the term which I learned because I, which is co-opetition, and it's it was actually coined in in the spa uh, context of the 20th century. Uh, a sociologist uh, used it because within a spa you have to collaborate but you're also in the competition with other institutions, but you have to defend this, the place. So it's, you're in collaboration and competition at the same time as well. So are there any more questions? I Aaron wanted to ask a question. Oh, I yeah. All right, so this is the people with British time. They are still sort of alert. <laughs> I have seen my Dutch colleagues uh, disappear one after the other at seven o'clock, which is the latest for a Dutch dinner. So <laughs> happy enough we still have people from the UK around. We have the aficionados. <laughs> yeah. Astrid? We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Astrid. No. I said, did not Karen have a question? Aha! Not you. No, but I thought in the, in the chat, Karen had a question, Karen Southworth. I can't see anything there. Yeah. Well, maybe like me last time. I had a question and then I disappeared. <laughs> so, Karen, do you have a question? Karen doesn't answer. Okay. No. Sorry, I... No question, she so, said. No questions left. So okay. it's time to sum up. And thank you very much, Sophie, for this wonderful talk. Very, very interesting. Very nice. Thank you. We learned a lot again. And thank you Thanks. all for the discussion. And yes, now we have a summer break and we will join each other. We will meet again in the uh, after the summer break in the autumn. And Christian had already these two talks announced. So maybe uh, and hopefully there will be more. So thank you all and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the work you're doing there. And I'm